one, the casting. As mentioned, there is a, an actual cast that happens with this. Um, we may not really be using much fly line, if any at all. The fly lines that we usually use are extremely thin. Um, truthfully, the only reason we use a fly line is for competitions. In competition, we're uh, mandated to have a fly line, which has to be, I think the minimum diameter is 22 thousandths of an inch, um, at which equates to like a triple lot weight fly line, so really, really thin stuff anyway. Um, so are those, had, are those 12 feet? Uh, this is a 10 foot, that's a 10 foot 8. Okay. Uh, and you see rods used up to 11 foot. I would say this is my comfortable maximum. There are disadvantages once it gets too long, I'll explain those too. But yeah, the fly lines are really just, I don't want to call it an excuse, but that really is what it is to be competition legal. If we had it our way, we'd just run mono on our lines um, because it offers enough weight for us to cast and offers way, way more line control. Um, the thing about this style of fishing is that when we make our cast, we want our leader to be as dead straight to our flies as possible so we can detect strikes. Our leader system, if you haven't seen it before, uh, there are lots of different formulas out there, but there's one pretty common theme that you'll see, and that is indicator line. So it looks like this. You can't see, I'll pass this around too. It's, um, it's a bicolor, or just a high vis, it doesn't have to be bicolor. But uh, it's a high visibility mono, and that is placed somewhere in the midpoint of this leader before our tippet. That, is, that takes the place of an indicator. We don't use indicators with this form of fishing. Um, it indicators offer a lot of downsides to fishing. For one, they're not very versatile. So if I go from a pool where I'm fishing six feet deep and then into a riffle, you know, immediately afterwards, that's two feet deep, I have to re-rig the whole indicator system for that to work. With this, all I do is I raise my rod tip a little bit and I'm fishing in the zone. It's much more efficient going through different water. So that's one reason. Uh, the next reason, again, not competition legally, you can't fish indicators in competition. Even if we could though, we wouldn't because it doesn't fish as well. Other thing about an indicator, it creates a hinge point which creates slack in our setup. So if you think you have your fly line going along the surface of the water, it goes to an indicator, you know, a big bubble, and then it drops down to your nymphs, all that line and that elbow turn, that's slack. So when I set the hook, I have to uh, account for all of that and compensate to pick up and become tight to my fly and get that hook into a fish's mouth. Similarly, when a fish takes it, there could be slack that's piled up with the current underneath the indicator and it causes a delay between the time that fish takes to the time it registers on the indicator. So that will, uh, that, you know, a little bit of lost time, coupled with the lost time of trying to set that up, results in a lot of lost fish. That's hard to see on an indicator, you know, it doesn't always shoot down, it'll just twitch or move, you know, not everyone catches that. Um, everyone misses fish fishing indicators. There's that. Um, they aren't very stealthy. Indicators land hard, or if they don't land hard, they're at least big on the surface of the water. Fish pick up on that. This is a much stealthier way of getting into the zone as well. So we make our cast, we land our tippet, and we want to be dead straight to our flies. So we have that ultimate sensitivity and that quick hook set that we need. Uh, especially in fast water, fish take on instant, and so you want to be tight to it, ready to go. Going back to the fly line thing. Um, if we have fly line out the tip of our rod, fly line is weight. We all know that. That's how fly rods cast. That's why they're weighted the way they are. But that weight also offers a downside, which is if we um, say it made say a 30 foot cast and we're trying to hold our line up, that line is drooping. Now, what that's doing is it's causing slack. Again, slack is the enemy in, in this. It's kind of common. Thing. It is in casting and in fishing. How's it going? <laughs> um, so, we want to maintain that tight connection. Fly line is bad. So that's the reason we use these long leaders. And again, if it was up to us, we wouldn't use fly line. We would use, you know, I know Spanish guys for fun fishing. Um, just use 50 meters of line tied onto their, their reel. And they don't fish all of it, obviously. They can't cast that far. But it's just to reduce that. Fly fishing. Use your own definition, whatever you want to call it. You can't back cast it. You it can. Fly you do. And I will prove it to you in the parking lot for one. <laughs> um, the reason that these rods work, I'm back to these. just going to use the weight of the fly then. Nope. I will cast the leader for you if you want. I will cast the leader and no fly line. You want proof. The trick to these rods is they are relatively soft. Um, but what makes a good deer and rod is two things. One is that it has to be able to load without a fly line. All right. See, this sounds pretty obvious, but in practice it's a little tricky to pull off. What it means is that in your cast, that rod has to fully load down to at least the midsection to get enough power behind it to roll over that, that line. So just in the cast, you want that thing bending down to at least the midpoint. The other thing is that you want a very quick responding tip. I'm not talking about a fast rod. Uh, generally speaking, these 
depending on your definition of fast, would be considered on the more moderate slow end. But what makes a good nipping rod is having that tip bounce back to a resting position without delay. And the reason for that is that, again, there's no fly line on here, there's no uh, real weight to it. Having a fly line when you're casting a normal setup means that that weight settles down the rod tip. It doesn't vibrate, the weight of the line settles everything down. If you make a cast with a, you know, a poorly designed neuro nipping rod and the tip is bouncing around, everything that the rod does translates to the line. Again, just like in casting, it, it, that's how it works. So if this is bouncing around, you have jitters going through your leader. If you have those jitters, you don't see the strike. The strike is just, if you were to take that line and sort of pull it, you'd see it jump up. That's our strike indicator. And if the line is bouncing around, a fish takes off the bat while it's still doing that, we're going to miss it every single time. So what we want is a really quick to respond rod that comes back without much delay there, you know, one, two, maybe hops, and we're, we're good to go. If you consider that a lot of this fishing is in pocket water, you know, that's a very short drift, you know, maybe a five foot drift on the long side of things can be shorter. Our drift is over before you can blink an eye, and so any delay there definitely works against us. So a good nymphing rod, it's a soft rod that can cast under its own weight, and it's a rod that responds very quickly. Those are the two big things there. Uh, there are other things that you may like in a rod. As mentioned, uh, length is one of those. So most Euro designed rods are 10 foot to 11 foot long. I find the longer rods tend to be less responsive in the tip. They tend to wiggle and vibrate a little bit more. So I find 10, to, this rod here is my personal favorite, 10 foot 8 inch is my favorite. Um, awesome. That's going to depend also on the rivers that you're fishing. Like on the credit, I like a 10 footer. If I go to the Grand, that 10 8 is just magical uh, because it offers a little bit more line control at range so I can you know, fish further away from a fish and not risk spooking it as much. Um, also, a longer rod tends to be on the softer side, not a rule, but you know, in general, that's the way you'll find it. Um, and so those softer rods protect those lighter tippets. As I mentioned, the Spanish, the French, fish a lot of 8 and 9x tippets, stupid small stuff. Having a rod that's too quick or not forgiving enough, you'll break off on your hook set every single time. Having a soft rod offers the shock absorption that you need to protect that tippet, uh, similar to you know, a bamboo or a glass rod or any of those that well up for, for lighter stuff. Um, that's the, the concept there. Now all that is, is a personal preference. People like glass rods, people like slow rods. There's no right or wrong there. There's a couple of modifications I've made to these rods. Um, so these are factory rods, but I've done some stuff to them. So on this guy, what you'll see is I've got a guide in a really weird spot on that one too. Um, what this is, is a way to keep my line tighter. So again, going back, slack is the enemy. If you had your first rod, typically, this was the factory one, this is the one I added. Your first guide is a good ways up from the seat, you know, a couple feet, whatever that is. And in that space, you have slack line that builds up. Okay? Again, in this style of fishing, any bit of slack really, really works against you. So having the first guy here keeps it up, keeps it from bowing in here, and gives me a lot more sensitivity. That's the only reason I put it in there. It's uh, something that I picked up a while ago from some other competitive guys that I really, really like. The other thing is on this rod here, I'll pass around so you guys can see what I need. Is I've, uh, I, should, I should stop saying I have a rod built to try to do it for me. But um, I've taken a piece of mono. This is like a 15 pound uh, maximum or whatever that keeps stuff. And it's been spiraled down the blank. See? And then just tie it off that. So what's a little funny, the reason I do that, say it's raining, okay, and my blank gets wet. What happens with these leaders, again, because there's not really fly line going through them, it's just mono, is that becomes a very sticky surface. And you find that the, uh, the mono starts to adhere to the blank just a little bit. And because there's no real weight outside the tip, it stays there. It doesn't get pulled taut, so it, it separates from it. Um, you know, just having the mono and then one or two very, very light flies on the end, it, it just stays stuck and it makes it harder to cast. So what that does is it it raises the line off of the blank and keeps it from adhering to it. Uh, it can be really helpful. Not so much if you dump your rod, it'll still stick then, but if it's raining and if it's damp, then it definitely goes a long way to help it. So that's why I like uh, as far as the reel goes, really doesn't matter, uh, whatever you like. The only thing I like to look for in a reel is I don't like click and pulls, for one. Uh, reason is, it's very difficult to fight a fish and apply the right amount of pressure if you're fishing those stupid light tippets again, right? If I'm fishing 8, 9x, 
the margin for error is pretty damn small uh, in palming a reel. So you just don't have as much consistency as, and control there. I love palming reels when I'm fishing heavier stuff, when I'm salmon fishing. It's fine. But in this place, I don't think it really has a, a spot. It, it doesn't really work with the setup. So just something with smooth drag. That's all I look for. And smooth being the keyword as well. Again, you don't want anything jumpy that could cause a break off. Um, other than that, totally personal preference. Leader design on this guy. As I mentioned, there's a ton of different leaders. And as I mentioned, each, um, each form and anything there kind of has its own leader design. Uh, you know, Czech style is pretty heavy and stout, while the Spanish and French use really long, delicate leaders uh, for presenting at range. I think you can do every technique with the same leader. I think those longer ones are the more versatile ones. There's nothing that says I can't fish up close with this leader still. It just means that's better at fishing further away as well. So my leader setup, you might laugh at it, but is crazy simple. Off my fly line, I tie about 10 feet of that indicator tippet that I passed around, just direct to the line. Off of that, I run how much tippet I need. And that's it. Um, I keep it simple because any sort of knots are breakout points, the weak points in your, your system there. And I find that by using such a light, light, light leader, uh, again, reduces the sag. Even just a, a tapered leader, that's weight again, and that can cause sag as well. So this allows me to run almost a direct line. So yeah, what I actually mean, do you leave it tag it? Tag oh, tag it? Yeah. No, yeah. no, never. For the same reason I was about to get out with why I don't like a loop to loop on this particular setup. Um, you are constantly bringing that connection through your guys when you're landing fish because of how long this is, and that just causes, a, you know, gives you a chance to lose the fish when it gets bumpy going through the guides. So I prefer a nice, smooth connection. And some guys will even put glue on top of that knot to really smooth it out. You know, some uh, just like uh, UV resin or some epoxy, something like that, can help a lot. No. What's the biggest size of fish you would target with the uh, Euro Nymphing? I don't really care. Uh, this rod here will land um, any fish you find in Ontario. Now, I mean, really? if you catch one of those legendary 30 inch browns in the Prada, I mean, logs are going to be an issue for you, but I think they would be with any uh, setup. In terms of just landing the fish, the great thing about Euro rods that people don't understand, I don't think, until they have a chance to fish one, is the amount of pressure you can apply to a fish. If you're fishing, again, that you know, classic eight foot four weight or whatever it is, and you've got even just like five, six X tippet on there, you're constantly gonna be like hesitant to apply an excessive amount of pressure to your line because you're gonna be wary about breaking it off. With these rods, because of how much shock absorption they have, they still have a fair amount of power on the bottom end, and you can actually bend these things almost right over on themselves um, and, and really, really turn those fish quite well. So it's a surprisingly powerful rod once you get into it. It's just the tip that's extremely light. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about um, about the weight of fish you're catching. You know, there are, there are four weight models of these rods, these are both threes, um, that you can get your hands on. I don't like them for around here because they don't, remember when I wanted to talk about casting under the weight of the rod. Um, that requires a pretty soft rod and four weights don't do it as easily. They're not as sensitive. They aren't as good at protecting tippets. But if I lived out west and fished the bow all the time, yeah, I'd pick up a, a 10 foot 4 weight and fish that. Because I'm going to use heavier tippets, probably 4 or 5x. I'm going to use heavier flies on the whole, so I might as well have that reserve power. But for around here, I much prefer the lighter runs, personally. And of course, you know, use the gear uh, suited to uh, conditions as well. I mean by that, I'm not a fan of over fighting fish, especially in warmer months. Uh, you know, if water temperatures are getting to the you know, higher 60s, I don't fish light stuff. I, I want to fish heavier, I want to make sure that I'm bringing fish in in a reasonable time so not to exhaust and kill them. Um, but if conditions are good, then, you know, if I have to fight a you know, 20 plus inch fish for a couple minutes, then you know, I'm not going to worry about that too, too much. Right? Um, that about covers it for the uh, rods and wheels lines. Um, what about bunch. cost? What's that? What about minimum cost? Cost, yeah. Um, there are some pretty good rods out there for the money. So this guy, this is the Cortland. This is probably one of the most popular rods in the competition scene for a while now. Um, and it was the first rod that Cortland, I think, ever did, to my knowledge at least, um, in recent history. And it was done by a buddy of mine who actually left his job at Portland to work with Thomas and Thomas, who designed that rod as well. Um, but that guy goes for about 360 bucks. 
and it has been a just dynamite rod. There are less expensive options still, but I think that is by far and away the best you can do for the money. Okay. And then as far as reels go, you probably already have something that works. Lines, again, it's kind of optional. If you really want to urine anything line, um, then they run you know, probably about 70 bucks, 80 bucks. They're less expensive than a full line, so there's no tape or anything to them. Um, and then, yeah, leaders and stuff is all pretty minimal. So I really just account for the rod. Everything else is pretty straightforward. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that more or less covers it for a year, I think. Go and see what another leader option looks like to pass this guy around. This is a pre built option. Level one. This is a, a Rio. This is what a check nymphing leader looks like. These are much easier to cast. Worth noting <coughs> off the bat, definitely, just because they have. And they're more weight to them, they're pretty heavy taper. Take the guesswork out of it. I'll pass that around as well, so you can kind of guess sense. Looks like 